Following Nixon's resignation, Gerald Ford takes the oath of office on August 9th, becoming the nation's 38th president. On September 8, 1974, President Ford issued Nixon a full and unconditional pardon in an attempt to move the country beyond the Watergate scandal. A pardon means that the person accused of a crime will not be charged, convicted, or will be set free if currently being punished. Nixon can never be tried for his actions in Watergate. Ford was accused by many of making a corrupt bargain with Nixon, but he explained that the purpose of the pardon was to end the national nightmare, instead of prolonging it for months, if not years. This would cost him the 1976 presidential election. Ford's two-year stint as president was more of the same. The economy plummeted even further. The U.S. went into the greatest recession since the Great Depression. In 1976, the U.S. celebrated its bicentennial, its 200th birthday. Ford succeeded in restoring honesty and humility to the White House. The bicentennial celebration involved commemorative coins, a freedom train that visited all the lower 48 states, fireworks, parades, lotteries, and even major athletic events. Television and the media also ran patriotic programming. By the time the celebration was over, the nation had remembered its history and could begin to put Vietnam and Watergate behind them. On domestic matters, Ford proved more conservative than Nixon. His chief concern was bringing inflation under control. In his efforts to curb inflation, the president was unwilling to use wage and price controls and called instead for largely ineffective voluntary efforts, known as whip inflation now. The U.S. was in a serious recession in 1974 and 1975. When unemployment exceeded 9%, Ford finally agreed to a democratic passage package to stimulate the economy. Central to the economic problems was the continuing energy crisis. In the aftermath of the Arab oil embargo of 1973, the OPEC cartel began to raise the price of oil by 400% in 1974 alone. Even so, American dependence on OPEC supplies continued to grow, causing inflation to really reach 11% in 1976. Stagflation continued as Ford ran for re-election and was defeated by Jimmy Carter, an outsider from Georgia. In 1976, the Democrat ran an outsider for president, Jimmy Carter. He was a peanut farmer and former governor from Georgia. He promised Americans that he would never tell them a lie. This was a calculated reaction to Vietnam and Watergate. Americans believed him and narrowly voted him into office. Carter believed that the energy crisis and our dependence on foreign oil was the most important issue facing the nation. He didn't realize how hard he would have to fight, but eventually got the National Energy Act passed. It did three things. Number one, it placed a tax on gas-guzzling cars. Number two, it removed price controls on oil and gas produced in the USA. And number three, extended tax credits for the development of alternative energy. To help deal with the energy crisis, Carter created the Department of Energy. In the summer of 1979, renewed violence in the Middle East caused a second major fuel shortage. OPEC announced another major price hike. As you can see on the graph, inflation rose over 10%. Carter tried many measures to fix the economy. None of them worked. President Carter then went on TV and gave his now famous Malays speech, where he complained about America's crisis of spirit. It seemed to Americans that he himself had given up. His popularity slipped. His inability to solve the energy crisis will be a key factor in sending Ronald Reagan to the White House in 1980. President Carter also pushed to improve conditions for women and minorities in the late 1970s. Carter's administration included more African Americans than women than any before it. He appointed 28 African Americans, 29 women, and 14 Latinos to the judicial branch alone. The courts had begun to turn against affirmative action. In Regents of the University of California versus Bakke, it became more difficult for organizations to establish effective affirmative action programs, as the university's medical school affirmative action policies were ruled unconstitutional. In 1979, Carter created the new Department of Education. Carter also sponsored a bill requiring public schools to provide instruction to students in their native language while trying to learn English, also known as bilingual education. Many banks excluded people in low-income neighborhoods from loans and other financial services. This practice was sometimes known as redlining because it was possible to draw a red line on a map clearly defining these neighborhoods. If you look at the map of Durham, North Carolina, the areas shaded in pink represented the areas that banks excluded. The practice especially affected minorities. President Carter pushed through Congress the Community Reinvestment Act, which required banks to make credit available in poor communities 
preventing the decay of low-income neighborhoods in inner cities. President Carter disagreed with Nixon's foreign policy of real politic. He strived for a foreign policy based on human rights. Those are the freedoms and liberties expressed in the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. If a country violated those rights, Carter would cut off aid to those countries. Carter's U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Andrew Young, championed the cause of human rights by denouncing the oppression of the black majority with the system of apartheid in South Africa and Zimbabwe. He cut off military aid to our allies Argentina and Brazil because they imprisoned or tortured thousands of their own citizens. President Carter also convinced Congress to ratify the Panama Canal Treaty, which gave full ownership of the canal back to Panama. This improved relations between the United States and other Central American countries. This emphasis on human rights meant an end to detente since China and the Soviet Union were known to treat critics of their governments badly. When the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in December of 1979, detente collapsed completely. This aggressive action ended a decade of improving U.S.-Soviet relations. The U.S. feared that the invasion might lead to a Soviet move to control the oil-rich Persian Gulf. Carter reacted by, number one, placing an embargo on grain exports and the sale of high technology of the Soviet Union, and number two, boycotting the 1980 Olympics in Moscow. After having campaigned for arms reduction, Carter now had to switch to an arms buildup. On January 23, 1980, Carter announced a policy that would be known as the Carter Doctrine, in response to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. The Carter Doctrine stated that the U.S. would use military force, if necessary, to defend its national interests in the Persian Gulf region. The belief was that Soviet troops in Afghanistan posed a grave threat to the free movement of Middle East oil. The Soviet actions in the Middle East all but killed Carter's efforts to get the U.S. Senate to ratify the SALT II Treaty. President Carter achieved his greatest diplomatic achievement at Camp David. It's the presidential retreat in Maryland, a helicopter ride away from Washington, D.C. Through intense negotiations, Carter was able to broker a peace deal between Egypt President Anwar el-Sadat and Israeli Prime Minister Begin. They became known as the Camp David Accords. In it, Israel agreed to withdraw from the Sinai Peninsula. They had seized the peninsula from Egypt in the Six-Day War in 1967. In exchange, Egypt formally recognized Israel's right to exist. The Camp David Accords was the first peace agreement between Israel and an Arab country. The Middle East was also the setting for Carter's greatest frustration and defeat. In January of 1979, the Ayatollah Khomeini staged an Islamic revolution in Iran. The former leader, the Shah, fled Iran. He country hopped from Egypt to Morocco to the Bahamas to Mexico until his pancreatic cancer worsened. He insisted on coming to the U.S. for treatment, and after much deliberation, President Carter allowed him into the U.S. This angered Islamists in Iran who wanted the Shah extradited to Iran for trial and execution. Islamic students took out their anger by storming the U.S. Embassy and taking 66 American diplomats hostage, calling the U.S. the Great Satan. They released 13 because they were women or African Americans, and one because he got sick. That left 52 hostages. Six Americans who were not there hid in the Canadian and Swiss embassies for a few months before escaping with Canadian passports. The hostages were not treated well. The militant Islamic students would parade the hostages out blindfold. At first, President Carter tried diplomacy to get our hostages back. We stopped buying oil from Iran. We froze billions of dollars in Iranian assets, and world opinion was in our favor. When that didn't work, we tried to rescue the hostages on April 25, 1980. Eight helicopters taken off from the USS Nimitz. Only six helicopters made it to the rendezvous blue point. They needed six helicopters to accomplish the mission. One of the six remaining suffered a malfunction. President Carter then called off the mission. As they were about to head back, one helicopter collided with the support aircraft. Eight Americans died and were left. The bodies were recovered by Iranians and paraded in front of the television. Carter was humiliated and all negotiations were put on hold. Meanwhile, there was a presidential election to be won. Ronald Reagan ran against Jimmy Carter in the 1980 election. Carter's popularity plummeted after the failed rescue attempt. Reagan ended up winning in a landslide. But there are two things going on behind the scenes. Carter was coming up with a second rescue plan, and Reagan is believed to be part of the planning. Since Iraq had just invaded Iran, the Iranians were interested in negotiating a settlement. 
We also had an ally in Algeria who acted as the middleman. On January 20, 1981, less than 10 minutes after Reagan was inaugurated as president, the hostages were released. They flew first to Algeria as a symbolic thank you to help, for helping us. Then they were greeted by former President Jimmy Carter at, US, at a U.S. airbase in Germany. When they finally reached home 10 days later, they were treated to a huge parade in Washington, D.C. and New York.